All right, well, I think we have three o'clock here in the Eastern Time Zone. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Ben Kunkel, and I'm the Director of Student Programs at the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. Thank you for joining us today in the first of a series of webinars uh, we're putting together. For those of you stuck at home during the variety of school closures and stay at home directives uh, that have been issued around the country, just a few technical points for you. Uh, if you've been to some of our student webinars before, you'll notice that this is a bit different. Uh, due to the large number of registrations we had, we had over 300, so we weren't sure how many to expect here. It looks like we've got uh, last kind of a little over 60 of you joining us right now. Hopefully that number will keep uh, increasing as we go. Uh, but due to that, the numbers there, we were unable to run the webinar like we normally do uh, in WebEx and you can use that platform. So your mics and webcams have been disabled and you can submit questions using the Q&A function. Uh, I'll be monitoring those and sending them along with the professors as we're able to work them in. Um, we also have two technical assistants with us, Catherine and Francis, who can help you if you're having problems with the, the WebEx platform itself, if you're not getting audio properly or something along those lines. If you right click on their names and select chat, you can communicate with them. Uh, the subject of today's program is the meaning of the Declaration of Independence and its relevance in the early 20th century. We'll be focusing on two speeches with different perspectives on that subject. Woodrow Wilson's, the author and signers of the Declaration of Independence and Calvin Coolidge's speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And joining us today to discuss those speeches are Dr. John Mosier and Dr. Jason Stevens, both of whom are professors here at Ashland. Gentlemen, you wanna take it away? Sure thing. Um, so yeah, this is actually something I've been working on recently. I'm writing a paper that I'm hoping I'm hoping to give at a conference in early June. We'll see if it actually happens. But dealing with the way that the Declaration of Independence was remembered during this period, you know, when the when the when Thomas Jefferson wrote the uh, the Declaration of Independence, he was talking about natural rights, right? Rights that we had that were that were uh, that came from our Creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But by the end of the 19th century, the idea of natural rights was really not taken very seriously by intellectuals. Right? And I won't go into the reasons why, but, but the fact is people, various thinkers with all different political views kind of mocked the idea of natural rights. They saw it as silly. And this sets us up for uh, Woodrow Wilson's talk in 1907. Let me give you a little bit of background on this, on this speech. Um, Woodrow Wilson at the time was president of Princeton University. He, was a, he had a long academic career teaching history and what we would today call political science. Um, but he aspired to a political career. And already by the time of this speech, he was being talked about as a candidate for governor of New Jersey. Uh, even though he was a native of, of Virginia and, and was really culturally a southerner, he had lived in New Jersey for a long time as president, as, as professor at Princeton University and later as president. So now people are starting to talk about him as a candidate. He's a good speaker, uh, he's dynamic. Uh, maybe he is what the Democratic Party is, is, is looking for. But there's a problem with the Democratic Party at this time. It's kind of divided into roughly two factions. One of them were conservative Southern Democrats, uh, and uh, the other, the others were more um, populist, like William. If you've heard of William Jennings Bryan, that, that was his wing of the party who really wanted to push reform. We might call those the the progressive, uh, the progressive Democrats. And Woodrow Wilson was more and more identifying himself with the progressive wing, but. He wanted to be careful because he didn't want to offend the conservative wing either. In other words, he was doing what smart politicians always do, trying to, uh, trying to, to, uh, to, uh, to stay on good terms with multiple factions. And you can really see this reflected in this speech. He was, uh, he was invited to give a talk in, uh, in, in Williamsburg, Virginia uh, for, uh, to, to, for, for the, uh, the 4th of July, right? And, and of course, what was more natural than for a politician or for an aspiring politician to give a speech on the 4th of July about the Declaration of Independence, right? We've always done it, we still do it today. But what's really interesting about this is what he does with the document. And right from the outset, you can see that. It is common to think of the Declaration of Independence as a highly speculative document, but no one can think it so 
who has read it. Um, in other words, what Wilson is saying here is it's not as theoretical and philosophical as you might think. If you're paying attention to those opening paragraphs where he talks about natural rights, you're really missing the, re the, the, the most important part. What's, what's important to Wilson? It is a strong rhetorical statement of grievances against the English government. So all that start of part about, you know, ravaging our coasts and burning our villages and, and doing bad and, and uh, uh, waging cruel war, all those details about what the English have done, in Wilson's mind, is the part that we should be focusing on. In fact, four years later, when he was running for president in 1911, he would say, if you want to understand the Declaration of Independence, um, do not read the preface, right? In fact, ignore that bit about natural rights, which he doesn't really buy. So look what he does. He says, all right, it does indeed open with the assertion that all men are equal and they have certain inalienable rights, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then he kind of dismisses that. He says, a little farther down in that paragraph, no doubt we are meant to have liberty, but each generation must form its own conception of what liberty is. No doubt we shall always wish to be given leave to pursue happiness as we will, but we are not yet sure where or by what method we shall find it. In other words, don't pay attention so much to those sweeping words, liberty and uh, and, and um uh, and happiness, because those are terms that we're left to to redefine in each in each generation. Um, in other words, don't worry about the theoretical stuff; it's the practical stuff. A little bit later, he goes on and says it's the principle of individual liberty that 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 guides us, and he talks about Thomas Jefferson here. Uh, he was an astute politician. And an interesting philosopher, but he leads with an astute politician. In other words, once again, we have to look to Jefferson, the politician, as more important than the interesting, the interesting philosopher, because ultimately he says, certainly he was a most inscrutable man. We can't really understand his philosophy. It would be impossible to make a consistent picture of him. That should include all sides of his very genius and singular character. So it's really the political Jefferson, uh, Jefferson that we that we need to understand, and 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 not the theoretical, uh, philosophical type uh, stuff that we need to be paying attention to. Um, yeah, I'm scrolling down here and picking up on some uh, on on some things that I think are worth making uh, making mention of. Um, he talks about, uh, now let us hold this mirror up to ourselves. This is about the middle of the document. And see if we recognize in it the image of our own minds. In that mirror, we see a conception of government which frankly puts the individual in the foreground, thinking of him as the person to be at once protected and heartened to make a free use of himself the responsible administrator of his own liberties and his own responsibilities and of government as the empire, umpire, and which depends upon law for nothing else than a clear establishment of the rules of the game. That is hardly our notion. We are different, right? But uh, we, are hard, we are indeed in love with law, more in love with it than were the makers of the government, but hardly in love with it as a government of mere regulation. For us, it is an instrument of reconstruction and control. So forget about, you know, yep, yeah, you know, the, the back in the founders' day, it was perfectly acceptable to to emphasize uh, to emphasize government as umpire, and law is simply simple simply the rules of the game. We today have a much more expansive view of, uh, of, of government and law. We need to be able to follow that while still honoring Thomas Jefferson. This is an important point. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had no more liking, no more fondness for natural rights than Thomas Jefferson. But Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican. He didn't have to mention Thomas Jefferson all the time. He does in some of his speeches, but he never really dwells on it. Because, in fact, for Republicans, Thomas Jefferson wasn't all that important. A lot of, a lot of, uh, of, 
lot of Republicans, in fact, look to Alexander Hamilton and not Jefferson for inspiration. But if you want to have a political career as a Democrat, you have to be able to to uh, to say good, great things about Thomas Jefferson, and in fact, use Jefferson as an inspiration. It used to be, not so much anymore, that Democrats always celebrated Jefferson Jackson Day as the founding is is, is like the 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 day that celebrated the founding of their party. So they look back to Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. So you're not going to get very far in democratic politics without you know by by running down or ignoring Thomas Jefferson. So what Wilson really does cleverly here is takes Jefferson and gives all praise to Jefferson but says if you're using Jefferson to justify things like limited government and natural rights uh, then then you're doing it wrong. Jefferson if we're going to we what we have to do today is make Jefferson useful for the current for the, for for our dealing with our present problems. This is why he's he talks about the really important part being the list of grievances that the British committed against the uh, against the, the colonies. Look through that list, he would say, there's nothing in that list that's really relevant today. So if we're really going to honor Jefferson and his legacy, we have to take Jeffersonian principles and apply them to our uh, to our modern problems. Now he says the individual is important. Right? He has this this uh, the the very paragraph after the one I was looking at, just a little bit past the halfway point. He talks about uh, extending this new theory of law into some of the details of our of our life. Um, I want to go about halfway into this. It says, uh, oh, we know, okay, the, the, from one body of hidden individuals, we turn to another. I don't think this is the best, best passage I could go to, but it'll, it'll work. It'll do. Uh, of hidden individuals, we turn to another and say, go to, we will instruct the government to regulate this thing in place of boards of directors. This is something he's going to get, he gets at through the next few paragraphs as well. Actually, here's the here's the paragraph I really wanted you to look at. It is only, so we're near now toward the bottom, it is only in this way, right, of, of finding the individual in society that we can escape socialism. Woodrow Wilson hates socialism. He thinks that progressivism, that is common sense reform, uh, is the way that we can escape socialism. If the individual is lost to our law, he was he is lost to our politics and to our social structure. If he is merged in the business groups, he is merged in the state, the association that includes all others. Unless we can single him out again and make him once more the subject and object of law, we shall have to travel still further upon the road of government regulation, which we have already traveled so far, and that road leads to state ownership. This is really a clever passage, because now he's reassuring the conservatives in his audience, and he's in Virginia, so there are a lot of Southern conservatives in his audience. He's reassuring them that he doesn't want to go way down the road of government regulation, because that's going to end up in ownership. What we need to do is find the individual again, uh, the problem is, in our society, it's harder and harder to identify the individual because, after all, we don't live in Jefferson's time anymore. Right? Back in Jefferson's day, the average American uh, worked for himself, right? Probably worked a small farm somewhere. Uh, he was, you know, he was the owner. He and his family owned the uh, owned the land, worked the land, and were and were independent. That's not the world we live, or somebody, they own their own business, right? A blacksmith shop or something like that. But that's not the world of the early 20th century. There are major corporations. People, hardly anyone works for themselves anymore. They work for corporations of varying sizes. The people, the owners of corporations are not individuals. You have boards of directors who represent hundreds, if not thousands, of, of stockholders. So the problem is, if we're going to get to, if we're going to identify evils in corporations and try to punish them, 
What we have to do is find the individual in the corporation. And that probably means punishing individual directors for sins that are for crimes that are committed in their uh, within their within their companies. So here he is taking progressive reform and showing how it is absolutely consistent with Jefferson's emphasis on the individual. He doesn't say we have to buy into this idea of natural rights. I mean, the term rights hardly ever shows up in this. Um, you know, vaguely, liberty, liberty is a good thing, but we don't know what that means. Happiness is a good thing, but we don't really know what that, what that means. But he seizes on this thing about the individual. He says, by focusing on the individual within these massive organizations, we can protect Jefferson's legacy and apply Jefferson's ideas uh, to the real problems that America faces in 1907 which are really, really different from the, the problems that were faced in Jefferson's time. And I think with that, I am going to uh, uh, well, we say one more thing. By such, the second to last paragraph, by such means we should prove ourselves indeed the spiritual descendants of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, right? We, now we've, we've shown ourselves to be good Jeffersonians by pursuing a reform agenda. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop and turn it over to uh, Professor Stevens. Yeah, Dr. Moser, that was really good. Um, I want to um, maybe build on that a bit, but you know, feel free to interrupt me at any point in this conversation because, uh, as Ben pointed out in his introductory remarks, right, usually when we conduct a class, it's not just us here lecturing and just you know throwing out information, but we actually like to, to have a conversation. With our with our students and and with each other, to say nothing of a conversation with Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge, um, and what you see in these two documents, especially when you you read them together, like we, we've done for the purposes of this webinar, you see a conversation developing not between Moser and Stevens or you know uh, you know Uncle and Burkett, but between. Wilson and Coolidge, um, right? Even though they're not talking at each other, right? But through these documents, we see that they are that they are doing something like that because they have two very different approaches or two very different answers to the same fundamental question. How should we read and therefore how should we understand the Declaration of Independence? As Dr. Moser just told us, Wilson has a very clear answer on that front. How should we read the Declaration of Independence? As Wilson said in another place, if you want to understand the real Declaration of Independence, skip the preamble. If you want the real Declaration of Independence, the meat and potatoes of the Declaration, skip the first two paragraphs. Skip that paragraph about the laws of nature and nature's God. Skip that paragraph about all men being created equal, and certain self-evident truths, and Unalienable rights, natural rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that just governments um, get their powers from the consent of the governed. Skip all of that stuff. Why? Because as Wilson said in the very opening paragraph that Dr. Moser focused on, right, that is all speculation. That's all theoretical. That's all sort of pie in the sky. And it doesn't really matter for our current situation. For Wilson, the emphasis is on that, those, that list of grievances. That's the real Declaration of Independence because that's the practical side of the Declaration of Independence. And Wilson, um, who, by the way, you should keep in mind, he's the only president with a PhD. Uh, maybe this is evidence for why professors shouldn't, don't make good presidents, I don't know. Um, but he's the only president with a PhD. Um, his argument is, and I'm just, I'm just sort of making sure I understand what Dr. Moser was teaching us just a few minutes ago. Wilson's argument is, is that the founding principles in those first two paragraphs, all that talk about a liber liberty and equality, that was all well and good for them, for their generation, but we cannot understand those principles in the same way as the founders understood those principles. We need to constantly reinterpret those principles for ourselves. And in fact, that's a duty that the founding generation lays upon us. As Wilson says, 
Um, no doubt we are meant to have liberty. I'm just reading from that first paragraph. No doubt we are meant to have we are meant to have liberty, but each generation must form its own conception of what liberty is. No doubt we shall always wish to be given leave to pursue happiness as we will, but we are not yet sure where or by what method we shall find it. That we are free to adjust government to these ends we know. But Mr. Jefferson and his colleagues in the Continental Congress prescribed the law of adjustment for no generation but their own. They did not attempt to dictate the aims and objects of any generation but their own. So when Thomas Jefferson and the founders wrote the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, they were simply explaining their own thoughts on government. Those thoughts, those principles, they're not binding on future generations. The founders were speaking simply for themselves. What the founders want us to do is to reinterpret those principles over time. That is the object. That is the purpose that the Declaration of Independence lays upon us. As he says in the next paragraph, this is still Wilson, we are not bound to adhere to the doctrines held by the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Right? Keep that in mind. Wilson says we are not bound to adhere to the doctrines of the American founders. We are as free as they were to make and unmake governments. We are not here to worship men or a document. Every 4th of July should be a time for examining our standards, our purposes, for determining, for determining afresh, afresh what principles, what forms of power we think most likely to affect our safety and happiness. That and that alone is the obligation the Declaration lays upon us. I, I, I want to use that as the bridge between this document and Coolidge's document. Wilson says the purpose of the 4th of July, and he, he delivers this speech on the 4th of July. And I think that's something we, we got from, from Dr. Moser's talk, right? This is 1907. Wilson says, right, we're gathered here today when we come together to celebrate the 4th of July, and we should celebrate it, Wilson says. But what should we do to celebrate it? Wilson's argument is we need to think afresh about what principles we want to guide our generation. Every 4th of July, we celebrate the Declaration of Independence by remaking the Declaration of Independence. That's how we honor the founders, Wilson says, to reinterpret the Declaration. In fact, in another place, um, Wilson will say, right, we need to consider what are to be the new items of our new Declaration of Independence. That's what the purpose of the 4th of July is. That's how you celebrate July 4th. You rewrite the Declaration of Independence. That is not what Calvin Coolidge thinks about when he considers, okay, how can we celebrate the 4th of July? And Calvin Coolidge, he didn't have a PhD. He was liberally educated at, uh, at Amherst. Coolidge was, however, and I don't think this is unimportant, Coolidge was the only president born on the 4th of July. Coolidge is born on Independence Day. Um, he has the nickname Silent Cow, but as you read his speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, you see that actually Silent Cow has a lot to say. And he has a very different take on how do we celebrate the 4th of July, or how should we think about the Declaration of Independence than, than Wilson? In fact, that's how Coolidge begins his speech. The beginning of Coolidge's speech, delivered in Philadelphia on July 5th, 1926, is an answer to what Wilson just said to us about the purpose of the 4th of July and why we should celebrate. Here's Coolidge's answer. And again, think of this as sort of a conversation between these two men heard from Wilson. Now here's Coolidge's response. We meet to celebrate the birthday of America. The coming of a new life always excites our interest. Although we know in the case of the individual that it has been an infinite repetition reaching back beyond our vision that only makes it the more wonderful. How our interest and wonder increase when we behold the miracle of the birth of a new nation. Now here's the key line. It is to pay our tribute of reverence and respect to those who participated in such a mighty event that we annually observe the fourth day of July. 
whatever may have been the impression created by the news which went out from this city on that summer day in 1776, there could be no doubt as to the estimate which is now placed upon it, which is now placed upon it, excuse me. At the end of 150 years, the four corners of the earth unite in coming to Philadelphia as to a holy shrine and grateful acknowledgement of a service so great, a few inspired men here rendered to humanity that it is still the preeminent support of free government throughout the world. This is a total rejection of what Wilson just told. Wilson says, right, we shouldn't, we, we don't come here to honor a document or, or men, we come here to think about, right, afresh what principles we want to guide us. Coolidge's message is, couldn't be more different. We are here to honor great men who gave us eternal, everlasting principles. Principles that have resulted in the increase of happiness, not just in America, but throughout the world all of humanity, right? For Coolidge, the purpose of the 4th of July is not to rethink afresh what new principles we want to make for ourselves. For Coolidge, the purpose of the 4th of July is to rededicate ourselves to those original purposes of the American regime. Not to throw out what the founders gave us and try to replace it with something new and better and more shiny to rededicate ourselves to those old principles and try to learn more about those principles and the men who originally espoused those principles in 1776. Uh, towards the end of his speech, Coolidge will say uh, exactly that. I'm looking at the, um, the penultimate paragraph now of the speech. So we, right, we looked at the beginning, now I'm going to the end. So the second to last paragraph of the speech, um, he says this, uh, under a system of popular government, there will always be those who will seek for political preferment by clamoring for re reform. While there is very little of this that is not sincere, there's a large portion that is not well informed. In my opinion, very little of just criticism can attach to the theories and principles of our institutions. There is far more danger of harm than there is hope of good in any radical changes. Here's the key line then. We do need a better understanding and comprehension of them and a better knowledge of the foundations of government in general. So Coolidge says we need to understand those old principles better. That's what we really should do because the founders, they knew what they were talking about. They revolutionized the world with their Declaration of Independence because it was those principles of the Declaration not the grievances, right? You you read this speech from Coolidge. He doesn't focus on the grievances. He focuses on those principles in the first two paragraphs. So as Wilson told us, if you want to understand the real Declaration of Independence, skip the first two paragraphs. Coolidge's response in this conversation is, no, the first two paragraphs, that's the heart and soul of the Declaration of Independence. That's the really important part. The list of grievances, that'll change over time, right? I mean, right, as Dr. Moser said, right, you know, ravaging our coasts, pillaging our towns, right? That, I mean, yeah, that's relevant in 1776, but by 1926, when Coolidge is delivering this speech, right, those grievances no longer matter. But you know what still does matter? We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's one more part in this speech that I want to draw your attention to. This is towards the end, a little above where we were just reading. It's the paragraph beginning with about the declaration there is a finality. If you can find that paragraph, that's it, again, it's towards the end. It's the paragraph that begins with about the declaration. I want to read this. And this is Coolidge's response to Woodrow Wilson. And I think even as Coolidge is speaking this or writing this, he has in mind Woodrow Wilson. Here's what Coolidge says. About the declaration, there is a finality that is exceedingly restful. 
It is often asserted that the world has made a great deal of progress since 1776, that we have had new thoughts and new experiences that have given us a great advance over the people of that day, and that we may therefore very well discard their conclusions for something more modern. But that reasoning cannot be applied to this great charter. If all men are created equal, that is final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is final. No advance, no progress can be made beyond these propositions. If anyone wishes to deny their truth or their soundness, the only direction in which he can proceed historically is not forward, but backward, or the time when there was no equality no rights of the individual, no rule of the people. Those who wish to proceed in that direction cannot lay claim to progress. They are reactionary. Their ideas are not more modern, but more ancient than those of the revolutionary founders. So what does that mean? That means that what Wilson proposed, remaking the Declaration of Independence every year, for every new generation in the name of progress. Right? Wilson is, you know, the leader of, you know, one of the intellectual leaders of right, the early American progressives. Religious response is, if that's your approach to the Declaration, if that's how you read the Declaration, that's not progress. That's not progress. That's not moving forward. Because if the Declaration of Independence is true, if those principles in the first two paragraphs, the preamble, if that's true, you can make no progress beyond those principles. Yes, you can make progress in other areas, right? In science, medicine, technology. Progress can be made in those areas. But in terms of how we think about human nature and the purposes of government, no progress can be made beyond. Thomas Jefferson, the rest of the American founders, gave us in those first two paragraphs. As Wilson says, if all men are created equal, that's final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, natural rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that's final. You cannot make any progress beyond those principles. If you try to do that, that's not going to take you into sort of a glorious ideal future that's going to take you backwards in history in time back to what coolidge would call in another place the laws of the jungle right you're just going back to a time where right kings and potentates determine the extents of your liberty and what your rights are instead of the understanding of human rights that we get from the declaration that as dr moser said right our, our rights come from god from the creator, from the laws of God and nature, as the declaration puts it in the preamble. If that's true, if Jefferson's right, then any notion of progress beyond that is unjust. Um, Coolidge was not a progressive like Woodrow Wilson was. Um, Wilson, we might say, was, was a capital P progressive. Um, Coolidge was a lowercase p progressive. Right? He believed in progress. He, he, liked, he, he had no objection to many areas um, that some of the other progressives may be focused on, especially at the state level when he is governor of Massachusetts. He said, so, for example, Coolidge supports the 17th Amendment. He supports anti-child labor laws, especially again at the state level. Um, but Coolidge was not a capital P progressive, right? Like Wilson, who thought that you needed to reinterpret the Declaration of Independence each generation to make it better or more applicable to the present generation. Coolidge's argument is these principles are always applicable for all times if we understand those principles rightly. They are true for all men at all times and all places. As Aristotle observed, fire burns the same way in Greece as it does in Persia. 
And as Newton observed that the apple invariably falls downward from the tree, whether you're talking about 1776 or 2020, or America or France, right? there are certain principles that are true for all men in all times and all places. That's Coolidge's argument, his reading of the Declaration of Independence. That's why the first two paragraphs are so important to him. Um, Wilson, for the most part, denies that. Right. As a progressive, things are constantly changing. And because things are constantly changing, so should our principles. And our principles need to keep changing with the circumstances in order to keep up with those the changing times. These are two very fundamentally different interpretations of the Declaration of Independence. I don't think they can be reconciled. Right? The question that we may consider is, OK, who makes the better argument? Who do we think is right? They can't both be right. They may both be wrong, but they can't both be right. So I guess my question to you all would be, who do you think is right? Coolidge or Wilson? Okay, so we got a uh, we got a question from Casey Miller. A very interesting one, I think. Uh, did their different views represent the ideas of the two parties or were they, or were they their individual opinions? I'll take a crack at this and then I'll see if you have anything to add after that. Sure. Um, that it, it, in a way, it's 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 somewhere between the two. Um, certainly, they're expressing their individual opinions. Uh, but when you look at the parties in the early 20th century, they're not nearly as united as they tend to be today. I mean, you know, if if you if, if someone says, "Well, I'm a Republican" or "I'm a Democrat," you can immediately make some assumptions about people and where they stand. On you couldn't have done that in the early 20th century. Both, and certainly in the 1910s and 1920s, both the Republicans, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party had a progressive wing and a conservative wing. Mm -hmm. um, among the Republicans, you, could, you had guys like, uh, like Harding and Coolidge or, or Taft before, before him, even though Taft called himself a progressive also. But then you also had uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Robert La Follette who were possibly even more radical I mean, than, than, uh, than, than Wilson. And then the Democratic Party, I taught, I, when I was kind of setting up the, uh, the context for the Wilson speech, uh, I, uh, I mentioned that he was going to be speaking to a group of largely conservative Democrats, which is why he really felt the need to emphasize Jefferson and identify himself with the Jeffersonian tradition, even though, frankly, he doesn't buy the idea of, of, of inalienable rights. Um, oh, one thing I want to correct that I said. I said the speech was at Williamsburg. It was not. It was in. Um, it was in Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. point, but there it is. Go ahead, Doctor. No, no, I, I, I agree with that completely. Um, the only thing I would add would be that um, right the the political theory of progressivism. You now we haven't really you know defined very well, and you know it, it, it's a lot harder to do than you can in, in maybe these circumstances. But progressivism is a political ideology was not something that one party right, had you know, an, a, an exclusive uh, right to. Progressivism was something that permeated both parties. In fact, during, this, during the, the late 19th and early 20th century, most of your progressives were Republicans. Most of your early American progressives were Republicans. Later on, as, as the 20th century moves forward, it becomes more the domain, perhaps, of the, the 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 Democratic Party. But Wilson has a lot to do with that in leading that charge. Um, but even the Republicans at the time, like your Calvin Coolidge's, they're not going to come out and say, "I'm not a progressive," because who's who's against progress? Right? Everybody was trying to lay claim to this right to this mantle of of being the one who was in favor of progress. It just it would depend. Okay, what are you talking? In what terms are you talking about that progress? Are you talking about science, medicine, technology? Um, or are you talking about how we understand ourselves, how we understand human nature and the principles of good government? Coolidge says you can't make any progress beyond those principles. Wilson says not only can you, but you must in order to, to survive. If I could add one, one more thing to that. Um, it's interesting if you look at the at the three presidents of the 1920s and look how they look at how they deal with uh, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. Coolidge is kind of an outlier. You look at Harding and you look at at, at Hoover. They 
barely say a thing about Jefferson or the uh, or the Declaration. And is that so? I think I want to I want to suggest that there is something that unites Wilson and Coolidge, even though they're diametrically opposed in their interpretation of the Declaration. They are interested in ideas and they think deeply about the document and they and they think it's worth analyzing. Harding, not so much an idea guy. <laughs> um, uh, Hoover, while very very smart, probably one of the smartest men ever to be in the to be in the White House. Uh, was an engineer, and uh, you know, if you know any engineers, often they are they see themselves as practical problem solvers, not the kind of people to deal with uh, with 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 uh, abstract theory. But Wilson and uh, and Wilson and, and, and Coolidge are, have that in common. They're interested in the theory anyway. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point because, and you see that not only in these two speeches, but in many of their speeches, Wilson keeps coming back to this understanding of the Declaration of Independence and how we ought to think about the American founding. So does Coolidge in many of his speeches, right? The, the, the Declaration of Independence right, will keep coming up. You don't see that in many of the original documents when it comes to, yeah, Warren G. Harding or, or Her Herbert Hoover. It's there, but not nearly to the extent that you see in the writings of a guy like Coolidge or, or Wilson. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say this also, that Coolidge, um, he disagreed with Wilson politically um, and philosophically, but he respected Wilson. Uh, he admired his leadership during World War I, for instance. Um, Coolidge is president when, when Wilson passes away. Um, and Coolidge right, issued a proclamation celebrating the life of Wilson, and he says some pretty nice things about him. I was reading this before the webinar. He says, as president of the United States, this is Coolidge talking about Wilson, as president of the United States, he was moved by an earnest desire to promote the best interests of the country as he conceived them. His acts were prompted by high motives and his sincerity of purpose cannot be questioned. I've always, I've always loved that, that, that line about he promoted the best interests of the country as he conceived them, maybe sort of in an underhanded way suggesting, well, maybe he didn't really understand them fully. But as he conceived of the best interests of his country, he was always interested in promoting those interests. Um, and that was, what, two years before uh, Coolidge's speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. There's a, a question here uh, by Amelia Austin. Do you think that relying on the principles of Jefferson, a slaveholder, is in itself flawed? Jason, I want, I want I want you to take a crack at that first. Yeah. So the the question is, do we think that that following the principles of a of Jefferson, a slaveholder, is somehow flawed? Right. That's the question. Yeah. Um, I think Coolidge would have agreed with Lincoln when Lincoln said in front of um, Independence Hall, where, where Coolidge is giving the speech, um, "All honor to Jefferson." to the man who had the foresight, the capacity, the prudence to insert into a merely revolutionary doc document the abstract truth that all men are created equal. Um, for Lincoln and Coolidge, they both greatly admired Jefferson. Both Lincoln and Coolidge acknowledged Jefferson's mistakes, his limitations, right, his failures as a human being, such as we all are, but for Lincoln and for Coolidge, that did not detract from the soundness of Jefferson's principles. Because as human beings, we don't always live up to our own principles. Right? Many of us will say one thing and do another or do something that we know our principles contradict. Right? Jefferson was a human being like the rest of us. Lincoln and Coolidge understood that well. They didn't ignore those failures of Jefferson and the other founders. But for Lincoln and for Coolidge, those failures did not detract from the greatness, the soundness of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the only thing I would, would add is, uh, and this is something I only learned recently, because Jefferson, all right, this is a classic piece of, of hypocrisy. He's he's a slaveholder, but he but he's this great theorist of, of liberty. 
although he never said anything nice of, he never wrote anything nice about about slavery um and, and, and in fact often criticized it but there yeah there is this hint of hypocrisy there uh although i learned recently that ha that as someone who was heavily in debt he could not legally have manumitted his slaves uh they would have they would have fallen to the possession of somebody else yeah that's, that's right still, yeah under virginia law jefferson was prohibited from freeing his slaves right right so you know still yeah, that that doesn't entirely exonerate him in my view but it 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 it, it, it mitigates it i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh let's see katie has put something up here from trip do you think there could there there could be a middle ground by showing that those principles are the end point but how we progress those ideals in our day in our day to day life yeah all right so we could say those are the end point mm -hmm. um i'm not sure that there can be because it's not as though wilson wanted to say that we're just on our way to getting to in, you know uh, inalienable rights to life liberty and pursuit of happiness he outright rejected that such that such things existed and, and in that sense he was very much an intellectual of his of of his day if you read the the, the political scientists of that time they sneered at the idea that people had uh, that, that people had natural rights um now if trip's question is could there theoretically be a middle ground um maybe I'd have to think about that, but but it's that that certainly certainly Wilson and Coolidge would not have, have, have would not have seen there as <laughs> you can probably hear my dogs now that uh, that, that they did not see a middle ground between the two. All right, Jason, take it. Over. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, I I agree completely about the, the the Wilsonian view. That is to say, that right for Wilson, there is no such thing as natural rights. There is no such thing as natural equality or natural liberty among human beings, right? As the founders thought of those things. Because remember, Wilson said the meaning of liberty changes from generation to generation. If that's true, then there, there is no natural liberty, like Jefferson and the rest of the American founders talked about the nature of liberty. Um, Wilson's idea is not about we're trying to live up to these principles. Um, Coolidge, though, I think, does look at it that way. That is to say, the principles of the founding are are true and good and beautiful in and of themselves, and the way the founders thought about those principles right, is is good and true and and, and beautiful because the, the founders were right in the way they were thinking about the nature of liberty and human equality and the purposes of government. Um, but Coolidge's argument is that the founders and the succeeding generations that came after them, none of us have fully lived up to those principles, right? As some of you mentioned, Jefferson owned slaves, right? We're not living up to those principles. But the founders declared those principles. They found a new nation, which borrows Lincolnian language right from the Pittsburgh address here, a new nation dedicated to those principles. And for Coolidge, American history is about the struggle to, to live up to those principles. That's progress Coolidge can get behind, right? The struggle to, right, by succeeding generations, to live up to those original principles. For Wilson and the early American progressives, those there's something wrong or ugly about those principles. Right? You need to get rid of those principles. For Coolidge, no, you need to have those principles as sort of your, your star and compass to guide you. Right? And that's how generations can, can imitate the founding by trying to live right, a good life in accord with those, those good principles. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, along those lines, I'll, I'll say this. I know we've got many students with us today. I remember when I was in, oh, uh, middle school, junior high, something like that, we were studying um, the Declaration of Independence in my social studies class. I think that's what they still call, right, these class, right, social studies. That's where you, right, you, you, you would probably typically read the Declaration of Independence today. And our, on the first day of studying the Declaration of Independence, my teacher issued a new code of conduct for the class, a new series of rules for the class. 
So we all had to be in our seats before the bell rang. We all had to be sitting in our seats at a 90 degree angle. No talking, not even any questions. No one was even allowed to ask any questions. You couldn't use the hall pass anymore during this class time. Right, so sort of these draconian measures for the classroom. Some friends and I got together. And what we ended up doing was, you know, in light of these new strict despotic rules from King George III, right, we wrote our own Declaration of Independence. What we did was we copied and pasted the first two paragraphs word for word. And then we added our new list of grievances. We handed this to the teacher after, you know, two or three days of her tyranny. And she took it and she read it. And I won't tell you exactly what she said, but she said something along these lines. She said, well, darn it, but she didn't say darn it. Darn it, I was finally able to teach you guys something. Right? That's an understanding of the declaration that Coolidge could get behind. Not Wilson, right? Because you gotta get rid of those, you gotta get rid of that preamble. Question from Zachary Vincent. Coolidge talks about middle class values being important in the founding of the nation. Does he consider the middle class to be important for progress? Um, I'll take a, a stab at this one. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what section of the speech you're talking about there because I didn't see reference to, to middle class. But when he did tend to talk like that, he did not mean the same thing as we Americans consider middle class today. Um, almost everyone says a middle class. You could say you, you define it in terms of income. If you make more than a certain amount, but less than a certain amount, you're in you're in the middle class. But Coolidge would have looked upon the founders and those who inspired the founders as having come from a specific social class in Europe um, that was neither the landed aristocracy. And remember what what meant what made you an aristocrat was not how much money you had, but the fact that you're you were born to aristocratic parents. Um, so your 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 whole bloodline was considered aristocratic. That was the, that was one class, and then of course there was the class of uh, landless or very little landholding peasants who didn't have much had nothing in the way of rights, uh, at least that were recognized by the governments. That, that, but they made up the, the, the vast majority of the population. And then you had in between of those, uh, the, in between those, a group that uh, was associated with the towns and the cities who uh, were neither aristocrats nor did they work with their hands. They were doctors and lawyers and bankers and merchants. Uh, and 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 in in a sense, they were into, they were intellectuals, right? A lot of a lot of learning came out of a lot of this group. And those were the sorts of people who have been credited with founding the, the American nation, which is why they very consciously set up a system that did not have rigid class barriers. Nobody in this country is born into a specific class and is required by law to stay in that class, which would have been the case in the, in, in the countries, of, uh, countries of Europe. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you're, you're referring to, where the, the Coolidge is talking about something like that in this speech. Dr. Stevens, anything to uh, to add to that? No, no, that sounds good to me. I, I did notice we, we've got another question in the, along similar lines. Uh, Mary asks, what was the role of the federal government slash presidency, according to Wilson and Coolidge? And how did they use the declaration to justify their positions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Dr. Moser, in his remarks, he actually looked at the part of Wilson's speech on the author and signers of the declaration where Wilson talks about um, he's actually very critical of, of think of those who think of government as simply uh, an umpire. Right? Somebody who basically calls balls and strikes safe or out. Right. But he doesn't actually enter the game as a player. He's just there to sort of oversee the game according to certain rules. Um, Dr. Mose, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but for Wilson, that's a very, that's too limited an understanding of what government ought to be doing, according to Wilson. For Wilson, it's not enough that government is just an umpire. The government must actually enter the game right, as an active player, one who's not just calling the shots, right, and making certain calls, 
but who's actually influencing the progress of the game. Right? Not picking winners and losers according to, to certain pre-established rules, but actually entering the game and changing those rules so that the right team is winning. Um, Coolidge would, would not agree with that. Coolidge would be much more in favor of sort of the more limited government. Government is the umpire of the game, or government is simply the policeman who enforces the law, right? rather than acting as an, right, an active player in the game and what's going on. Does that sound, does that sound right? I, I, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Anybody have additional questions in the brief time we have remaining? You know, I'll I'll point out that um, by the way, Coolidge. I, I I said earlier that he's, he's his nickname is Silent Cow, right? Apparently, he right, he didn't say a lot, and that you know that's true. There's a reason why he has that that um, that nickname. But we see here he has an awful lot to say, not just in this speech, but he has you know he has three books of speeches, uh, "Have Faith in Massachusetts," "The Price of Freedom," and "Foundations of the Republic." He has an autobiography. Which, if you haven't read Coolidge's autobiography, I really recommend it. It's it's really really good. Probably the best example of presidential memoirs after Ulysses S. Grant's. But in the the book of speeches from when he was president, Foundations of the, the Republic, the very first document in this volume, I read to you earlier in the webinar, right? A proclamation upon the death of Woodrow Wilson. This book of speeches, which was put together by Coolidge, he organized it. Uh, it begins with the death of Wilson, and the very last piece is called The Inspiration of the Declaration of Independence. Right, so the book begins with the death of Wilson and ends with sort of the return of the Declaration of Independence, maybe suggesting that after Wilson departs the world stage, um, we will look for, for hope from, um, not from men, Wilson, but from documents like the Declaration of Independence again. And Wilson's death makes that possible. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Um, Very cool. Mm -hmm. Ben, do you have some final words to uh, to take us out? Yeah, yeah. So thanks to both of you for, for uh, your discussion today. I think it was very enlightening, and I hope all of you enjoy it. And thanks to all the students for coming. Um, a number of you have asked, and I just want to make sure to remind, let you know that the webinar will be archived uh, on our YouTube channel, TeachingAmericanHistory.org's YouTube channel, within the next few days. If you'd like to rewatch it or share it with someone who couldn't come, uh, so we'll get that up very shortly. Uh, and if you enjoyed this, please look into our summer programs for high school students, the Ashbrook Academies. We have week-long summer programs held on our campus in Ashland, Ohio, where, like we did here today, we use primary sources to explore the past and understand history through the eyes of those who lived it. If you're interested in those, please visit ashbrookacademy.org for more info. And also, if you're uh, looking for a place for your undergraduate education, Ashland University is a great place to, to check out. Uh, you'll have professors like these in, in class every day. <laughs> um, if you have a strong interest in history or political science, it's a particularly good university for you to check out. Uh, we also have a program known as the Ashbrook Scholar Program, uh, which will provide you some extra scholarship money and, and have a lot of outside events and to support you in a number of ways. So. So please check that out at ashbrookscholar.org if you're a senior and still undecided about where you'll be attending. Uh, we still have slots left for the fall. Um, so our next webinar will take place a week from today on Thursday, April 2nd. Uh, our topic will be the election of 1932, differing visions of America's past and clashing visions for its future. We'll explore two speeches in that session, FDR's Commonwealth Club address and Hoover's speech on the consequences of the proposed new deal. Uh, and we'll be joined by doctors Chris Burkett and David Hadley for that. Uh, both from Ashley University as well. So look forward to seeing you guys back here then. And thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.